Hi, so I'm uh, Dr. Anderson. I'm from, I work at Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'm a joint faculty at Tennessee Tech University. Um, one thing I found is that the, uh, the secret to research is, is to do what you love um, and then try to get somebody else to pay for it. Um, but a lot of times, the sponsors, what they want doesn't overlap with what you want to do. Um, so you kind of have to fudge things a little bit. So this slide is what my sponsors want me to do, and then the rest of the slides are what I want to do. Um, I just didn't want this presentation getting back to them, and they're like, you know, what are we paying you for? Um, so. Oh, which way? Is it on a timer or something? All right. OK. So what I'm being paid to do is, is, is securing smart grid. Um, there's actually a definition for security. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, what I'm focus, focusing on is the availability. Most of the time, people, when they see security, it is on a timer. Is there a way to turn that off? No? Anybody? OK. I'm going to just keep flipping back then. Um, so people think of security, they think of uh, you know, encryption and things like that. That's not what we're doing. Um, what we're trying to do is make sure that data is available. Um, and, and my idea was that in order for data or information to be available, um, you have to be able to transmit in, under any sort of conditions. So the idea is that we want to create a deep learning protocol um, modem that can transmit under any condition. Okay? So like over here on the right, let's say we have a, a, some, some node down here in Smart Grid that has important information that I want to send to a node on the other side of the, of the city um, or room. Um, and let's say for whatever reason it's using uh, the acoustic channel, some sort of ultrasonic channel to send information. Um, and things are going great. It's communicating, right? And then a bunch of bats enter the room and they're screeching and you can't send information through acoustics anymore. Um, so these nodes are smart. They just switch to RF and they start communicating again. Um, somebody jams the RF channel. Um, the nodes are connected to Smart Grid. They just start using power line communications, and they keep communicating. Okay? So that's the idea of availability, is can we, can we create this magical black, communications, black box communications device that no matter what medium you're in, you can still communicate? OK, okay so that's the specific goal of DeepMod. Now what I want to do, kind of my my big vision is I want to replace all signal processing, right? all digital communications that we've developed over the past 75 years. I just want to get rid of it and replace it with a single machine learner. Um, so anybody who's tried to make a, a modem using like USRPs over the air is very, very frustrating. right? On paper, it works great. Simulation works great. As soon as you start going over the air, it's very frustrating. Um, and there's all these blocks. There's all these blocks that were written. Um, to make communications possible. Uh, you know, phase correction, uh, estimate the carrier frequency offset, match filtering, error correction. There's all these things that we have to do to make sure we can get bits from one side of the channel to the other side of the channel, right? We want to get rid of those and replace them with just one machine learner. Um, and, just, and just to, this isn't a hierarchical block, right? We're not trying to, this isn't, you can't push into this and see this long chain of digital process or digital signal processing blocks. It is just a machine. That's what we're trying to go for. Um, so there's a lot of work, recent work on machine modems, uh, some of which you've already heard at this conference. Um, my, ex my first exposure was in 2015 when I was asked to teach machine learning um, at Tennessee Tech. I didn't know what machine learning was, but I always love a challenge. So I bought the textbook, and I tried to stay about a chapter ahead of all my students, so they thought that I knew what I was talking about. Um, but, and I don't know if the machine learning people out there, you realize well, your first time's awesome. When you first hear about machine learning, you think you can do anything with it. Um, and it's because it's, it's, it does some pretty amazing stuff. Um, part of this class, I gave the, the, the students, uh, they, had, they, they had to do a project which was take machine learning and apply it to any part of your life. I don't care what it was. Research, your school work, whatever. You just have to do something with machine learning. And then one of the students, I asked him to um, replace a, a, a receive uh, digital receiver with, with machine learning. Um, so he did that, and the conclusion was, yeah, it works, um, uh, you know, so, so what? Um, 
and as an, as an aside, just this is an aside, nothing to do with the presentation, is so this student and I are actually have a DARPA Spectrum Collaboration Challenge team. So if anybody's interested or following that at all, um, you can come talk to us and, and, and see how things are going. Okay, a uh, quick note on vocabulary. I don't know what the chances are that, that two completely different communities start using the same words for totally different things. Um, it's very frustrating talking to a comms guy and then talking to a machine learning guy. So I'm gonna define it here, right? So a network is, uh, is talking about a communication network. So a network is when at least two nodes are talking to each other, okay? And I'm gonna use the word graph for the neural network or the machine learning brain that's going on. Um, a sample is what, those are the, those, those are the things coming in, in a, into your USRP or leaving your USRP. And an example is what's going into your machine learning block. Uh, what are, I mean, machine learning guys use sample. Anyway, lots of confusion, but this is what I'm gonna be using for this presentation, okay? Um, and then, just a quick thing about spectral efficiency. Uh, we're just gonna call that bits per sample. Um, so with, for the digital comms people, you have a lot of things like, you know, samples per symbol, uh, bits per sample, you have a, some rate error correcting codes, modulation, you have all these things, and then they boil down to this quantity called bits per sample. Um, which tells you how much information you're getting across the channel depending on what your sample rate is. Um, now, with DeepMod, we want it to be the same idea. But with DeepMod, um, we're gonna have something called bits per class now, and we're gonna have samples per example, which I know makes no sense unless you followed along on the vocabulary here at the beginning. But it all ends up being the same. If you do the dimensional analysis, you still get bits per sample. Okay, so, so we're not changing, we're not, we're not messing with um, Shannon or anything, we're still gonna talk about spectral efficiency. Okay, so why resiliency? And we've seen, we've seen similar, similar ideas to this um, already this week. Um, in the top left, uh, 50 years ago, however long, um, some human was given an AWGN channel and, set, and given the task of finding the optimal modulation if you wanted to map four bits to, to, uh, to, to a sample. Um, and we called it 16 QAM. Um, on the bottom, bottom left, fast forward a while, we asked the machine the same question. We said, if you want to map four bits to two samples, what's the best you can do? Um, it comes out with 16 QAM as well. Um, but what's interesting, and this is, important, this is important for the philosophy of using machine learning. For the bottom left, we didn't tell it what channel it was. The only question we asked them, we, the only question we told the machine is, is four bits, two samples. You do the rest. Okay, and it just so happened to come up with 16 QAM because we trained it in an AWGN channel. So it's really easy um, to come up with a, a, a different channel where 16 QAM fails, right? So, and it's just silly, I mean, it's just a toy example, but if instead of having, you know, um, white noise, you have some sort of correlated noise where uh, the noise is stronger in one of the dimensions than another, right? So if you do that in, in top right here, you'll see that 16 QAM will fail, no communications will take place. However, the machine, again, since we never asked it or told it what the, mo or the channel model is in the first place, it doesn't care. It's just gonna train. It's gonna say, well, what's the best way to, uh, to, to transmit four bits per sample in, a, in this weird funky channel? It's gonna try and stack them, and it does. Right? It comes up with the, in what it thinks is the optimal way to send bits across the channel. Okay? It's just, just a toy example, but it kind of shows you how a machine can provide resiliency in digital communications. Okay, so we want to do this over the air, so we're, we're, we're tired of doing simulations. Um, an, auto -coder, an auto encoder is kind of the classic uh, first step in, in a, uh, performing machine learning. And it's really simple. All that happens is, is device one sends a bunch of classes across the channel. Um, device two knows what was sent and then knows what it receives and it says, well, you know, I got these wrong. I'm going to update my graph so that next time you send those classes, I'll do better. And then it goes back and forth like that. The trans their device one comes up with a new set of classes, or new order of classes, sends them across the channel. The device two says, I know what you're supposed to send. Here's what I got. Um, I'll update my graph. And if you do that for a while, eventually they converge, and device two is able to understand device one. Um, so any anybody who's, who's uh, just a word of caution, if you're starting in on machine learning and digital communications, back propagation can't happen through the channel. Um, whereas, so if you just go to your simulation, you write some TensorFlow code, you hit go, um, TensorFlow will cheat, and it'll, it'll update the device one weights, 
based on what device two receives, right? So that's cheating, you can't do that. And so you have to have a way to break the back propagation, which happens naturally when you do it in real life because there's no physical connection between the two, two devices. All right, so um, I wanted to see this in action. So the first thing I did was I said, well, let's just pick a channel, we'll do the acoustic channel, uh, see how that works. Um, you make a really fancy Git repo. Um, there's a website that will, if you give it two keywords, it'll de uh, design a logo for you. So some, if you look at that logo down there, it was apparently that, that describes the feeling of DeepMod. I don't, I don't know. Um, that's pretty good. Um, you make some fancy hardware. So you, I made this rig. Uh, uh, actually, where's Trip? Trip made this rig for me. Um, it, it's a speaker microphone system that you can then just plug into laptops and, uh, and use GNU Radio to, to uh, run it. Um, so just to, the first thing I want to do, I wanted to separate, separate myself from digital comms a lot and then come full circle. So we didn't use bits yet. What we did was we used English phonemes. So what we did was, um, so the computer on the left has a little chat terminal. You type in a sentence. And then we use the natural language toolkit to map that sentence into English phonemes, which is just the sounds that you make. And those phonemes become the classes that our, our machine is going to learn. So it sends phonemes across the channel. And the receiver tries to decode that phoneme and map that back into words and sentences and so on. Right, this, was, this was all just for, for fun, right? Um, so what happens is, is, is you, 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 you set it in training mode, and it starts just sending noise back and forth, right? Um, and after, after a few minutes, it, con it converges to a language um, that both the transmitter and the receiver understand, and they're able to send information that way. And really late at night, when nobody's watching, I tried to talk to it, right? Because I was in this for weeks, right? I actually had complaints from my office mates because this was just going all the time because it was always trying to train. And it was audible, right? <laughs> so they were, they were really annoyed. They were ha finally happy when I went to RF because you can't hear RF. But, but, but you get to know these, pe you get to know these, com these machines, you know, kind of fall in love with them a little bit. They're like your babies. Um, so I tried to whisper to it at night. I, I, really, I, just, I, I wanted to mimic its language and see if I couldn't get some text to show up because uh, it understood you know, its creator. Um, but that never worked. But, but DeepMod did, right? So after you guys train these, it's a communication channel. It's chat terminal. It ends up getting about four kilobits per second in a four kilohertz channel. OK, but we, um, when we go up to RF, we're going to have to get a little smarter than that. Remember, my warning was that um, you can't back propagate through the channel. It's cheating, right? So it's all simulations are wrong, and it won't work in real life. So we need a way to make uh, the transmitter intelligent um, without, without this back propagation cheating. Um, so what we did was um, we're going to pick 256 classes, which are just essentially waveforms, so that we can have eight bits per class. And these classes are the transmitter converts them from classes into samples. And those samples are, are up converted to some center frequency and transmitted across the channel. Device two down converts them, knows what was supposed to be sent, um, so, it can, so it can update its, its receive graph. And then this is, this is the, the special part, is that device two repeats back to device one what it thought it heard. It doesn't repeat back what it knows it should have been. It says, what it, what, I think you said this, right? So device one says, I'm saying this. Device two says, oh, did you say this? Um, and, so with the, and then device one. When it hears that, it says, oh, it got these classes right. It got these classes wrong. And it has this critic that kind of sifts them. So the, the, the classes that it got correct, it's like, OK, those are good. I don't need to mess with those. The classes that got wrong, it's like, OK, I need to update my graph so that, so that device two can better understand what I'm trying to say. Okay? So in this way, we, we're adding some intelligence to the, tr intelligence to the transit side um, so that it can update its graph at the same time as, the, as, a, as device two. OK, so here's the uh, obligatory GRC flow graph. Um, I'm new to GRCon, but my impression was you have to have one of these or you can't be present. Um, so remember, what I'm trying to do is get rid of all signal processing. I want to throw out all, all these optimal algorithms and just replace them with one machine. So that's in the middle of there. That's DeepMod. Um, I have some helper blocks. I have a training source. And all that is is, is, is so that when you do your stochastic training, it does the same order every time. Um, I have a couple helper blocks, um, but they're very, very simple. So the DeepMod Phi receiver 
just takes samples and converts it to examples. That's all it does. There's no processing on it. It just takes samples and says, okay, I'm gonna squish these together and send them as an example to uh, DeepMod. And then the same thing on the other side is um, I go from class to samples and I wanna transmit them over the channel. Okay, so, um, and then you have your hardware endpoints, which in this case are, are the USRP blocks. Okay, so how do we do RF channel? So we have to add a whole lot of code to our fancy Git repo, um, but we make sure we have the logo still. Um, step two, and this is, this is, this is the, the key point of DeepMod, is you just change the transducer, right? Whereas at first we were doing the acoustic channel, now we're just doing RF, nothing else changes. It's the same code. I mean, DeepMod can literally transmit over either channel interchangeably, it doesn't care. Um, it just learns whatever channel it's, it's transmitting on. Um, so in this case, uh, for the RF, we did sample rate, omega sample per second. Center frequency is 900. We just picked those arbitrarily. Um, we picked, we picked uh, signal to noise ratio to kind of match. We did some simulations, and so we picked the over the RSNR to kind of match that to, to make sure everything was working okay. okay. Uh, as I said, there's 256 classes. There's 16 real samples per class, which gives us a spectral efficiency of uh, one bit per sample, which means that theoretically we can get a megabit per second in a perfect world. And the reason we picked those is because we wanted this to be realistic. We don't want, we don't because machine learning is kind of a buzzword. Um, people are like, oh, fine, you're using machine learning, great. But this is, this, this is, this is a viable way to communicate across RF, right? So we want it, it has to be, has to be high throughput. And then most importantly is there are no signal processing blocks. We did not use a single uh, block besides um, DeepMod, which, which, we, uh, which we made ourselves. So over, over on the left, you have the simulation, uh, bit error rate versus epic. Obviously, the more you train, the, the better you do, until you reach some error floor where you have so much noise that you just can't do better than that, no matter how much training goes on. Um, over on the right, it's kind of interesting that you can actually pre-train DeepMod. So offline, you can say, well, this is probably an AWG and channel. You can transfer that knowledge from your simulation into the over-the-air uh, radio. And it actually has some advantage. If you over the, look over on the left, it starts out at a better bit error rate, but then it converges to the same thing anyway. So it's uh, not that big of a deal. Um, then one thing we saw was that, besides the fact that it was working, is that uh, TensorFlow was the bottleneck. So you know, we're, we make a sample per second. That's pretty, that's a, that's a lot, and we're trying to pipe these through TensorFlow into this this graph that we've made, and it, it became the bottleneck, which was a little frustrating at first. Um, but one good thing is that um, after you're done training, inference is like a thousand times faster, right? So maybe it takes two two three seconds to train, um, but after that you're 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 doing uh, real time throughput. Okay, so getting, getting back to my sponsors, you know, they want to see, you know, resiliency and stuff like that. So this, this is kind of a fun plot. Um, so what I did was I, I set up a radio on one side of the lab, um, deep mod enabled, set up a radio on the other side of the lab, and at time T1, I turned them on. Okay, so at time T1, they're on, they don't know how to communicate, they, they have no, I mean, they're just sending energy back and forth, right? After a few hundred epics, they reach time T2, which is 100% throughput. Okay, so at time T2, they've established a language over the air that they can, can communicate on, okay? So they're sending every, every class, which again, it remembers eight bits, is, is making it across the channel. And then T3, a mean, so at T3, I turn on a narrow band jammer, and it, kill, it kills it, right? Because it learned to communicate over just, you know, the RF, the wireless channel, and so jammer doesn't like, so it kills it. However, it doesn't give up. Remember, we're proud of these little guys. Um, so what it does is, is it takes a while, but even with the narrowband jammer present, it eventually learns to communicate around it. Okay, so that's, that's at T4. So T4, it finally makes its way back up with the narrowband jammer present. And what's really interesting is, is when at T5, I turn the jammer off. So the, the, the channel's back to a good channel. And it, it does worse for a while, right? Why? Because it's like, well, I'm used to the jammer. You know, that's, that's the language we developed was this language around the jammer. Now you turn the jammer off, now we're kind of confused about what we're saying. Um, but not very bad, right? Not, not, not too deep. It, it, it recovers uh, fairly easily from, uh, from turning the jammer off. And what's really interesting, and I, I, I love this. I'm, 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 anyway, 
at t time T6, we turn the jammer back on. And after, after a really, really brief moment of, of loss, it's back up to communicating perfectly again. What that means is that DeepMod retained memory within its graph, within its brain, of the jammer. And remember, this isn't like a switch. It's not like, here's a set of waveforms for when there's a jammer, here's a set of waveforms when there's not a jammer. It's not that. It's, it, just, it just knows, right? So whether the jammer's on or off, it kind of it learned to retain that in memory, and it's able to adapt quickly uh, to those conditions. So sponsors are happy because we add resiliency. Um, well, let, I mean, let's, let, let's do power line. Why not, right? Nothing changes. Uh, we, we, we add a, a notch filter um, to the SMA connector so we don't blow up our radios. And we just plug it into the wall. And then we cross the street. We plug in deep mod across the street into the wall. The signal's going through some crazy network of power lines and transformers and all that stuff. But who cares? DeepMod doesn't care. All it knows is it's going to create a language that it can communicate across any channel. Um, and this is a work in progress. There's actually some, we've made progress since the slide was made, but um, anyway, we're, we're uh, oh. Every, when I talk about DeepMod with people, they get very excited and they're like, well, can it, ha can it handle you know, fragmenting pack? They, they want everything at this point, right? As soon as I explain this to them, I'm like, look at this physical layer. It can learn to communicate over any channel. Now they want it to do everything. They want it to do the Mac layer and the, the networking layer and everything like that, right? I'm like, it's not magic, right? It only does what we tell it to do. Um, so in order for DeepMod to work, some sort of signal still has to get across the channel, right? Something has to get there. How it gets there doesn't matter. It can be distorted, messed up, whatever. DeepMod will learn, learn that language, um, but something does have to get across. So um, at the end of the day, or at least so far, we were able to get rid of almost all processing. Um, DeepMod did not learn error correction on its own, um, because we didn't tell it to. I mean, it would have been cool had it just you know, come up with its own little error correction, which means that it performs well, but not with error correction, right? So it still has a, a certain bit error rate with a, with a, with a floor to it. Um, and another thing, it didn't learn frame synchronization. Um, which is, you know, you're listening to samples, which of the samples represent a class, right? It can't do that, um, which is unfortunate. So we're sad because, you know, we want to replace all the digital comms, not just, you know, nine-tenths of it. Um, so we're not going to give up yet. So just a couple comments on these two things that we didn't achieve yet. Um, for frame synchronization, we tried everything. Uh, continuous to tone-coded squelch system. That's kind of old school. That, that, that's when, when you're talking on the radio, your radio might send a tone which says, I'm talking. And then a, a, somebody else sends a different tone when it's talking. So what you can do is you can listen for that tone. And if you hear that tone, you're like, oh, this much, must be one of the, this, these samples must correspond to an example which corresponds to a class that I want to listen to. Um, we tried just straight up energy detection, just packet detection. Um, we tried preamble, which felt like cheating, because the whole point is no preconceived knowledge, right? And as soon as, you, as soon as you add a preamble to what you're trying to send, that's kind of like assuming a, uh, a knowledge. So that felt like cheating. Um, uh, GPS, uh, certain time slots that you're going to listen to. Um, and it ends up that DeepMod is cool with it. It doesn't have to be synchronized because it can handle being off by a few samples on, on either side. It, it, learns, it learns that that happens and it, and it can uh, compensate for it. And where we're going to go, obviously, is we, we want a machine learner. We want to have a machine that can learn when the frames are arriving. Um, it's a little circular because to train this machine, it has to know when the frames arrive. So it's like, you know, how, to, how do you do that? Um, but anyway, can't be perfect yet. And then um, for the error correcting code, um, again, DeepMod didn't learn it because we didn't tell it to learn it. We didn't, we didn't set it up. The, the, the network or the graph that we created for him or her um, didn't enable error correcting codes. Um, so what we want to do is we want to move away from, uh, it, it uses a convolutional neural network, uh, to a recurrent neural network. So if you look over here on the left, it's kind of the, your typical plot of, of what a turbo code looks like. And the plot on the right is, what is, is, is kind of a typical plot of what a cell in an RNN looks like. And if you look, there's a lot of similarities to it, right? Because um, with turbo codes, the entire, a single bit doesn't matter, or a single byte doesn't matter. The entire sequence matters. And that's exactly what an RN, RNN does, is 
a single letter or a single word doesn't matter. It's the entire sentence that you're trying to, trying to decode. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, what we've learned about CNNs and, and the critic model that we've had, change it to a, 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 an RNN, and see if DeepMod can't learn everything it already learned, but then add error correcting codes um, to it. So that's kind of our, our next step. Um, so conclusions in future work. Um, so this, this uh, I just Googled something and I found this little comic, com, uh, comic. And what I like about it is I really can do that. I can, DeepMind could send a text over a string, it really could, right? You just stick whatever transducers are on either side, of, either side of it, let it train for a while, you can send text messages over a string, right? That's the whole point. It doesn't matter what the, uh, what the medium is. Um, so a couple things we want to do in the future. Again, move away from the convolutional neural network to a recurrent neural network. Um, we need to fix the, the TensorFlow th uh, bottleneck. We messed around a little bit with GPU and all this stuff, and, and we'll get there. Um, because nobody cares that, that after training, inference is real time. Nobody cares. They always just ask, how long does it take to train, right? So I try to explain to them that it's fast after they're done training. Nobody cares, OK? So we need to have high throughput during the training period um, for people that care about it. And then finally, every single medium that we can think of, power line, underwater, deep space, whatever, we want to think of every media possible, stick DeepMod at it, and see if it can communicate across that medium, which is uh, the ultimate goal. That's it. All right, thank you very much. And we have some time for, the, for questions. There's one, actually, where's the other mic? Michael, Michael has the mic. There's two over there. Were there any here? Okay, you go first and I'll follow up over here. Was he pointing at me? I just couldn't tell. Oh, uh, so maybe this is a sponsor almost question, but <laughs> you, you mentioned how you got the Audible channel working yeah. and then you went to the RF channel. Did you ever set it up so that you were giving it both, both simultaneously? <laughs> so this, this is funny. My sponsor, you are a sponsor, I can tell. He wanted, he wanted to coin the phrase, um, medium hopping, where, where, you, where, you, <laughs> where you're on frequency and acoustic over here, and then you have to, it's crazy, right? Um, but no, we've never done them at the same time, not yet, not yet. Thanks. So we have a question over here. Hello, good okay. talk. Um, have you compared for the audio where it was communicating with phonemes, the capacity of the learn channel versus what the capacity would that be with communicating with just the set of phonemes? and then taking into account confusion between them, and then compare that to just the regular good old Shannon capacity? So I, not, there's 86 phone, phonemes, right? So you can map that to a certain number of bits per phoneme, and so you can look at what's the spectral efficiency based on that, versus actually using phonemes as a language. Is that what you're, I mean, is that what you're referring to? And then comparing those, the, 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 the bits per, per sample you're using versus the actual language itself. Um, no, we, we, haven't, we haven't looked at that. Interesting question, though. I think there was one more question over there. And then in the meantime, maybe, Jay, you can start setting up your, your slides on the, on the, they're on the laptop, right? Yeah. Okay, you can start doing that and we'll take that question in the meantime. Have you thought about uh, constraining what types of physical phenomena you can modulate? So right now I'm assuming the modem can do phase, amplitude, frequency. Have, have you thought about maybe constraining it to say like, okay, you can only use two out of the three or whatever? Yeah. So. So right now there's no constraints, but just right now it's just volt it's just samples, right? The voltage on the samples. I mean that's the only thing it does. Um, we have thought about that different um, different frequencies and so on, or different phases. Another thing we thought about is is making it look like something. So so as it's trying to communicate, it, it can't just be pulses. Maybe maybe we want it to look like Wi-Fi. We want it to look like Bluetooth. So we so we have these additional constraints on it. It is something that we're we're going towards. Right. Well, thank you very much again.